Hello, welcome to the Open Mic Comedy Podcast. I'm your host, Mark. If this is your first time here, welcome. If you're a returning listener, welcome back. And this is a very, very special edition of the Open Mic Comedy Podcast today. You've seen the title, you know who's on today. I've wanted to have him on since this podcast idea was conceived. He's been in the industry since 1995, performed on TV in the UK and North America, is a prolific ghost writer, and I don't mean the spooky kind, is written possibly one of the most important books of recent times for comedy performers. The name of this book comes up in pretty much every conversation I have at open mic nights with others. So it's my pleasure to welcome the creator of Finding Your Comic Genius, Mr. Adam Bloom. What a beautiful introduction. Um, thank you so much. I, <laughs> I didn't know it was a, in a conversation. Would you say part of every conversation at some point? I didn't know that. Um, I actually started in 1993. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I, I went full time in 95. Um, it was a bit easier to go full time quickly then, um, yeah. but it was still it was still unusual. But the, but Ed Byrne was doing the same thing. Um, I think Mackenzie Crook uh, used to be called Paul Crook Crook. Paul Mackenzie Crook Crook. Oh my God, Mackenzie Crook. <laughs> um, he's 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 running his Paul Crook. I remember we went for coffee and he said, "I'm going to change my name to Mackenzie," and I thought, "What an odd thing to do," and. Yes. He, he knew what he was doing because I suppose Mackenzie Crook's got a bit more flow to it, hasn't it? It's, it's seesaw. Yeah. You know, the, I talk about seesaws. Um, yep. No offence, Mark, but your name is not a seesaw. One no, one. it's very dull. People haven't read the book, don't know what I'm talking about now, but names with uh, equal amount of syllables on either side don't have a, as good a flow to them if there's more syllables on one side than the other. So, yeah, Mackenzie Crook is 3-1. Yes. So that's, a nice, that's a nice seesaw. No, so... So you you started in ninety three, a major way to being professional in ninety five. Yeah. Um, so how did you find those two years leading up to going professional? Well, I I was a sacked cocktail bartender who'd been dumped by his girlfriend the same day I got sacked. I mean, Ouch. I literally came home from work and said, "I've just lost my job," and she said, "I've got some more bad news." It was literally that. I was living with my mum, had next to no money in the bank, paying a little bit of rent, you know, like a nominal rent for my mum. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember realising I had nothing in my diary for the rest of my life. I when I have no appointments in my life. And, you know, I had friends and things, but I didn't have any appointments. You know, a friend would ring me up on the day and go, do you want to go for a pint? Um, so I just went, I just saw Harry Hill like a couple of weeks before. And he blew my mind. And I was like, okay, I've got nothing to lose. You know, sometimes you've got nothing to lose. It's a good time to do something. I mean, I started writing the book soon after my dad died and that moment then I, I felt not that I had nothing to lose but I, my diary was quieter than usual mm. I lost my stepmother as well the same year of 40 years um that's how the year that's like the year had 40 years in it it was a very long year it was a 40 year year um, <laughs> so I, um so in a similar way you know I went okay you got you know you've got to pick yourself up sometimes haven't you so yeah. Doing stand up was because I had absolutely nothing to lose. I felt I was at rock bottom and went, okay, have a go at that thing. And then, um, and right, but the book was similar. You know, sometimes you just need to give yourself a kick, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, I guess it's looking for something, something different in life as well. And absolutely. Just, absolutely. That but change of direction. Of, oh, sorry, one more time. I was just saying that, and that change of direction just gives you that little bit of a oomph that you never know what's going to turn out around that corner. No, I mean, I had a, a, a major lightning bolt moment. I was in my bedroom thinking about what I'm going to do with my life. And I just went, you've wanted to be a comedian since you were nine years old. Now would be a really good time to have a go at it. You've always known you're going to do it one day. So I was like, if I've always known I'm going to do something and I haven't done it and I'm free, this is the best time to do it. But it was a proper lightning bolt. I, my brain went, Boom! Now, yeah. <clears throat> you know it was a it was a proper. I, I mean, you know, it wasn't a, even a light bulb moment. It was a lightning bolt moment. And um, I mean, with regard to writing the book, if anyone listening to this is feeling like they're in a little bit of a rut, you know, just turn on your laptop or pick up a pen or even on your phone and just start a project because you know every every single thing that, you, that creative. Every creative thing in the world started with one thought. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's so it's... beautiful to think about that, isn't it? You know, you think about your favourite film. So my favourite film's Amelie. And, you know, one day someone went, I'm going to write a film about a lonely person who tries to make other people happy. Yeah. No, it's... Yeah, it's it's a, it's, a, it's a lovely thought in uh, <clears throat> keeping the brain working and and just doing other things and applying yourself to something. Um, and when it works, it feels fantastic. Well, the book six six months old today. Six months today. Yeah, wow. and, and when I, when I because I was so committed to it for eight months, my mum was really worried that. She said, what are you going to do when you haven't got a project? And I said, I'm going to promote my project. You know, at the beginning, I was just sending out books to, you know, people getting getting books to important people. You know, yeah. I, got a copy, I got a copy to Joe Rogan, Ricky Gervais, and Banksy. <laughs> to Banksy? Yeah, obviously not directly. Not, none of them <laughs> yeah. directly. But, you know, just like, you know, you know people who know people, and you go like that, that, that. Um, I mean, a friend of mine took one backstage to Ricky Gervais's sh- show that played him, knocked on the door and said, I've got a gift for Ricky Gervais, and it got to him. Wow. Yeah. Did you hear back? No, I didn't hear back. Uh, I like to think that on one of his private jet flights to a Norwegian stadium, he just picked <laughs> up and went, oh, actually, I'll have a look at this. And I did the maths. I mean, there's one person who shall remain nameless who has... 11 million followers on Instagram. Yeah. And I get like £3.62 commission per paperback and about 480 per Kindle. And I did the maths and it worked out that if one in a thousand of their followers bought my book, which is quite a reasonable uh, estimate, yeah. right? It's quite feasible, isn't it? I'd yep. make 43 grand in commission. Wow. <laughs> And there were probably some people here going, duh, 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 that doesn't make sense. Um, I might have got one of the figures wrong there, but basically it was it was a, it was it was forty grand plus. Uh, yeah, I just like you know the the power that people have, you know, who have got that much, you know, that many followers or, or that much influence on the media. Um, and you know, Ricky Gervais is always talk, talking about animal rights and things, so he uses his power for good, no doubt. Yeah. Um, but anyway, it, it, it look, you know, you walk past a homeless person, you give them a quid, you could really, if you put your mind to it, give them a hundred quid. Um, when I say put your mind to it, most people could find a hundred pounds. And if you haven't got a hundred pounds, you could deprive yourself of all your luxuries and save a hundred pounds. You know, we've all, yeah. you know, everyone's got a mobile phone. They didn't used to exist. You know, yeah. I can't live without my phone. Well, you did for the first 20, 30, 40 years of your life, depending on how old you are, right? Yeah. So, you know, put living up my phone. Yeah, you used to. Um, so my, my point is we can all change somebody's life for the better. I mean, obviously there's w- w- what some homeless people have problems with, with alcohol and drug addiction, as do some non-homeless people. So obviously yep. handing a homeless person cash could be an irresponsible thing to do. But, you know, you don't, you see my point. We yep. can change people's lives you want to. You could, get, you could feed a homeless person every day for the, the whole time you're walking past them you could buy them a sandwich and a coffee every single day and deprive yourself of a sandwich and coffee so i'm not saying these people in in with who influence uh have such power uh should always do it because we could all do that you know and most yeah. people can downsize their homes and have one less bedroom smaller mortgage and give the money they're saving on their mortgage to charity you know we're all we're all thinking of ourselves a lot of the time but it just yeah. made me think i know people i know you know i know people who are so incredibly influential they can make my book change forever yes yeah I, it's it's so how so the the book is six months old today yeah um how long did it take to actually write just under eight months just under eight months and it was new, it, year's day, the new year's resolution ah uh, okay yeah. i broke my new year's resolution within 24 hours this year so i'm not very good at things like that what, do you, what but, was so, it uh, to do a piece of exercise every single day for the whole of January. <laughs> and day two, you didn't do it. I didn't even. I didn't even complete day one. Day one. Day one finished and I hadn't started. It was like oh, today is the day I'm going to start. Day two was a uh, oh, shit. I didn't start. <laughs> there you go. You messed that one up already. But uh, here's the thing: though, you can, you can go back to it. You can. I, I will. I will go back to it. 
I will. But with the um, so the book took eight months to write, but how long was it in the making? I guess it's uh, what was there a point leading up to it where you thought, I've got this in me at some point when you look back and go, it's going to come out at some point? No, that um, I always thought, I mean, I've had a few people say you should write a book, and um. I thought, eh, it's too niche. You know, there were a million how to do it books and I wouldn't write a how to do it book. I'd write an advanced book and that's only a few hundred people in each country, but yeah. that's not enough. But actual fact, Amazon's global. And if you write a book for full-time comedians, bearing in mind that newer people will read it, just make sure yep. everything's understandable and clear. Um, and then you'll have a wider market. You know, my mum is 80, doesn't want to be a comedian. And she read all the bits I felt might have gone a bit too convoluted. And only once did she say, "That's that you lost me there. Only once. And I yeah. changed and edited it. So my point was, it's got to be clear. I don't want it to be a book that, you know, I read. I wrote a book on chess openings once and it just assumed I knew more than I did. And I couldn't read them past the first, <laughs> first page, right? So they didn't really, you know, they should have presented that on the cover or they should have been uh, made it more, you know, accessible. Um, I've got my first, so I've had Amazon reviews that are uh, uh, 2174s mm-hmm. but, and the rest are fives. But, the, and there's, you know, it's like whatever is it, 80, 80, 80, it, it's, a, it's a very high percentage, it's like 96% of fives. But the yeah. other day I got my first written review that wasn't a five and it was a two because all the fours were not written, they were just clicks, click four. Yeah. But someone wrote a, a two and they said, this book is not good for new comedians. It's only good for full-time comedians. And and I was I was hurt because I thought, well, that's your opinion. But I know people who haven't been on stage yet who said it helped them with their first set. So I think they they felt that it didn't go right to the barely beginning. Yeah. But it did say it is called an advanced book. It is called an in-depth guide. So when you go in deep, it, it, it's... I I thought it was a given that you miss out the obvious. Yeah, I I think the audience of the book is um, I I class it as everybody. So yes, when you when you talk about being advanced, I think when I think of like the demographic of the type of comedians. So you're talking like the, the first the first ten gigs, the first fifty, the first two hundred, the first thousand. Then you know proper proper open proper. Um, professional performers like I've mentioned in the intro is that whenever I speak to anybody on any open mic circuit whether they've done 20 gigs 50 gigs or 100 gigs it's like, so what books are you it's always what books are you reading I was like, oh I've got this new one from Adam Bloom it's about working out all your set bits and stuff like that everybody mentions this book so people are reading it and I'm even at the point now where I've I've found my voice on stage, but I haven't found my pace and my tone and the right words. As you're probably realizing now, is that I use a lot of extra words in stuff. <laughs> if, if, if that's the case, I suggest you write your stuff out. I don't write my stuff out, you see. Um, but as an exercise, writing your stuff out and looking for toppers or trimming stuff down. Because I, yeah. I mean, I wrote stuff out when I had a radio force, I had to write every word of it out. So I am used to, when I write for other people, I have to write everything out because I can't, you know, they have to be able to see word for word what I've done. I can't say yeah. it to them down the phone, obviously. So I've done my fair share of writing, but my process for myself is I bounce around in my head. But it's what works for you. You know, some people write by hand. Some people don't write anything down. You know, Jay-Z doesn't write any of his lyrics down. Right. Well, there are some rappers that couldn't comprehend that, right? We're all different. <laughs> yeah. We're all different. And that doesn't make him cleverer than them. It's just the way his brain works, right? Yeah. I mean, I had the, I had the, I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll be straight with forward you. I'm about three quarters of the way through the book at the moment. So what I've been doing is taking it in chunks. Cause I remember there was a part at the start where you said, don't read this all at once. It's really so, weird. I, I must come across very um, teacher like because I, I've said, I've met, I mean, at least a dozen people, maybe two dozen, who said, I haven't finished it because you told me to stop. And I thought, wow, <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's very flattering. It almost feels like I've almost bullied them into doing my way. Like, right. I mean, it's a bit, I said, you know, if you, please do this because if you don't, you know, if you read a whole, 
if you had a dictionary cover to cover, you've technically learned 100,000 words, but you wouldn't yep. be able to use them. And I think that's a good analogy because I wrote a book on comedy writing when I was very new. And I can only remember two things from mm. a you know, three, 400 page book. I can remember two things. Yeah. So you don't want to read a book and go, oh, that's interesting, that's interesting, that's interesting. You know, it is a, it's a guide. And, you know, some people are treating it like a manual to refer back to. And some people have read it, some people have read it three times. But I suppose because it's quite a long book, by the time you get to the end of it, it's worth starting again. I, I watched The Sopranos yeah. from beginning to end. And this was with my, with my mother and my children. And when we got to the end, we were like, oh, that's it. So we just started watching it again, and suddenly they're all, the kids are really young. AJ is like this, you know, young. Like, look how young they are! Oh my god! Yeah. But you know, so I, I I love the idea that you get to the end of it and read it again, or take it in chunks and refer back to it. You know, you refer back to chapters, and you know, um, it, I mean, I, I if if someone had written this book when I was new, I think the way I'd go about it is I'd be thinking about write, writing some material, I go back to the Create New Material page and, and chapter and read it again. And the corporate, yep. the bonus chapter about corporate is completely different to the rest of the book, which is why it's not titled uh, numbered and why it's at the very back, is a completely different approach to the rest of the book because it's just a load of uh, do's and don'ts and tips for being in a corporate environment. But things I learned the hard way, things I learned very much the hard way. I did, I did corporate the other day, didn't go well. Um, and they look at me like I'm this rubbish comedian. And I'm like, you have no idea how experienced I am, but you're looking at me going, yeah. this guy's rubbish. They're not thinking about the large tables with gaps between them, the dance floor between the stage and the, you know, I can't stand it when it looks like that. It's just degrading. Then occasionally yeah. I do a corporate gig that goes really well. But part of the reason it's gone well is I've had a phone call with a client and I've asked them 12 questions. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, just wish find someone, it. I wish someone would give me those 12 questions. I was doing corporates for probably five years before it occurred to me to ring the client and have a chat with them. Yeah. I used to just turn up in the outfit I felt like wearing, knowing nothing about them. Yeah. And it's, I guess as soon as you make that, that relatable to them and something that they're on side with, then they come with you on the journey and, and they're interested in listening to you rather than just yeah, like, oh, I've did- got somebody else on stage. Yes, if you but if you if you've never done a corporate gig and you've got that book, you would be a fool to not go through that chapter, at yep. least the checklist of questions. I mean, <laughs> is there anything I need to know about the company that's happened in the last twelve months? I was listening to a podcast the other day, a brilliant comedian talking to a brilliant comedian, and they mentioned that they brought up a subject at the gig and the, the gig fell apart, never got them back. They said, "Well, how am I supposed to know that that happened?" And I I, I didn't want to contact them if they're actually I've got the answer because it's yeah. cocky but the answer is ask them if there's anything you need to know and that covers everything yeah. you know you do a wooden leg joke and that room goes quiet because the boss has just had their leg amputated <laughs> my, yeah. my, my, Mike Gunn Mike Gunn used to pretend to be an undertaker gone in a top hat and black suit and he talked about his life as an undertaker and he had a joke about they say there's something called phantom foot syndrome where after your leg's been amputated you can still think you can feel it. And he goes, yeah, he, he's like me, he's got shaved head bald. And he goes, I mean, that's ridiculous. You know, if, if, if something's not there, you can't feel it. And then he's <laughs> it's beautiful, right? <laughs> and um, it, it's just beautiful. And um, a girl came up to me after a gig and she said, excuse me, I'm with a friend and she's an undertaker and she's got one leg. I think you should know that. <laughs> okay. How, how can he? I mean, it, it's unfortunate. I, I, yeah. I did a line about identical identical twins, but one's got a dodgy eye. And um, the promoter's ex girlfriend was in the room, and she said, "Oh, did you do that line specifically for me? Because you know that I've got identical twins, and one of them's got an eye pointing." And I went, and "Absolutely not. I'm I'm so sorry that triggered you, but you know what are the chances? Yeah, of someone having identical twins, one's got a dodgy eye." Um, dodgy is the the word in the joke. Uh, obviously, the yep. correct thing would be to say would be one eye that is pointing slightly different direction to the other one. Um, but the um, but yeah, so so yeah, with regard to a corporate chapter, that that is um, very much worth reading with regard to survival. But everything else about creativity, that's about you know uh, you know flow and rhythm and and um, yep. nice sounds and 
writing techniques. Um, someone said to me they use some of the writing techniques, and they 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 you know their turnover just got much quicker. They did they're not mm-hmm. you know not forever. It's only six months old anyway. But my point is that it helped. It yeah, helped. and that you know it's wonderful because you know they're not you know when Apple brings out a phone or a laptop. They're not being creative. You are. You you take yeah. their laptop and you go and sit on a park bench with nine hours of battery and a nice screen in front of you, right? That's you know when you take a picture with an Apple phone, it's you that points it in that direction. It's you that chooses what to take a picture of. You it's your moment. You know they're not yeah. creative. They're I mean oh, there's creativity involved, but my point is they're handing you something to be creative with. I'm not teaching you. I'm not making you funnier. You are just like a therapist says you're doing all the work. You know, I'm going, this is how I write material from scratch. Then you go, okay, yeah. I'm going to try that. And then you do it and it works. I didn't write the joke, did I? I'm just giving you the tools, just the way Apple's giving you a, a laptop. Yeah, I, I think as well is that, I mean, I, I had a, a moment probably in the last in the last week with regards to going back to the book subconsciously. So a, f- a friend of mine, she, I, th- I was talking to her saying, oh, I've got this new start to my set. Um, and I think it's a lot better than what it was before because she saw what a previous one that was a bit woolly and stuff. I said, I've got this new one. I've tried it once and it seemed to work. And she said, oh, let me know what it is. So I started typing out to her just on WhatsApp. And as I'm doing it, I'm editing it at the same time. Lovely. So I'm not actually typing out what I've said. I'm typing out what I want to say. Lovely. And I, I, I'm taking that thing going, no, I don't need that word there. No, go back and take that. And, and this this message that was like typing, set, probably set for like five minutes waiting for this response. I'm going, no, no, I don't need that word. I don't need that. Right. Maybe right. if I pause here, and it just starts flowing and starts coming with the experience. And having somebody put those things in front of you, like we talk about the, the things when you talk about balloon pops and stuff like that, those are they they feel like they're so obvious but they're not obvious when you're doing a gig so can, so I put in, can i can i so for the listener um bloom pop is my word for the moment an audience gets the joke and often a bloom can pop before you finish speaking and that means the keywords in the wrong place and the audience are ahead of you. Now there are bits, there are routines where you want the audience to be ahead of you with regard to they're waiting for you in anticipation, almost like a strip tease. We know it's coming off, but where, where, when's the moment we're waiting? We, we know what's going to happen, but I'm talking about a line, uh, a punchline with surprise in it. It's very common where a comedian puts the keywords in the wrong order. Yeah. So it lets the air out the bag or let's say the balloon. So for me, a setup is blowing up a balloon and there's anticipation, and we don't know where you're going. And then the actual surprise is the word, the syllable even, where yep. it all makes sense and we get the joke. It's it's <clears throat> awful when that syllable's halfway through the sentence and we've got to sit and wait for you to finish talking to laugh because it, it stifles it. Air comes yep. out the balloon, and when you pop the pin in the balloon, the balloon's small. It's as simple as that. So I gave some examples why I rewrote the sentences and – showed where the bloom pop is and showed why it, which of four versions is the best version. And, the, you know, this wasn't instinctive from day one for me, but, you know, you stand at the back of the room watching comedy for 30 years, you're going to, you're going to see things differently. So I'm just letting yeah. you inside, inside my head. And what was interesting was, you know, there was a comedian who'd been going maybe 20 years who had read the whole book and he felt that the bloom pop thing was, was revelation, revelationary. And I thought, but it seems so obvious. Now, yeah. when you say something like that, it sounds like you're, the message you're giving is, oh, I'm so brilliant. It's obvious to me, but it's not obvious to you. But that's not my point. My point is different things are different to our, different things are obvious to different people. Yeah. So you're sitting in a cafe seeing somebody being insecure because they're jealous that the person's flirting with someone else. And you're watching that and go, and then you'll say to me, did you see that bloke um, next table? He was clearly getting a bit jealous because his girlfriend fancied the waiter. And I'm like, no, I just saw some people talking. Yeah. And, you know, I'm sure that that comedian sees things I don't see. But yeah. with regard to Bloom Pops, I was just saying what I've been thinking for, you know, the, the, you said how long did it take to write the book? It's 30 years of thoughts. And yeah. there's a lot of stuff that I've said in car journeys before or in writing meetings that I've just put into words. But of course, when you put in a book, you're going to make it extra clear because you they can't ask you a question. If you say something in conversation, the friend says, not sure what you mean, 
then you start again, right? But in a book, you've got to make it absolutely crystal clear. Yeah. It's, to, it's the best, just to the best so, of your ability. Uh, to the best of your ability. Yeah. It's just, I, I look back at, I mean, I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm still extremely new to this. And um, but I look back at some of the <clears throat> first five gigs or whatever, and I'll watch them back and I'll, I, I see where the pop is. But then I make that mistake of carry on talking. Right. Um, those extra words are adding no value to anything. They're not doing anything. They're not structuring anything. The only thing they're doing is confusing the audience in that they think there's something else coming. Yes. And yes. that that laughter has where you expected that, that laughter to come because you carried on. They've gone, oh, that's not the end. Yeah. <laughs> and all you've done is you put four words at the end that mean nothing and add nothing to you. And you're like, why didn't they laugh? But then you look back at it with after reading your book or something like that, and somebody points it out. You go, "Oh yeah, that's good to know." I, that's, I, really I, good to hear. that's job that's job I, satisfaction you just gave me. <laughs> the, the thing is that I mentioned it's, Jeff Green. Um, I mentioned Jeff Green as an example of someone who pops their balloons early, but he mumbles under the after the balloon pops, so he knows when you're getting it. And to make yeah. it more conversation, because I'm very punchliney, right? Da 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 bang. They're clearly jokes. Yep. I'm, you know, I'm presenting them as a conversational person, but they're clearly duka, duka, bang. So what he yep. would do is he would go bang, duka, duka, but he mumbles underneath the laugh to allow you to laugh. So that he knows that they're not as relevant words. So if, if, if the punchline is, I got the book out and slapped him. So I slapped him with this, I slapped him with that. Then I got the book out and slapped him. So he would mumble the slapped him because he knows that yeah. you get it on the deck. That's a bad example because I had to think on my feet, but it, it, he knows exactly when the bloom pop is. So it's a case of rules are made to be broken, but know why you're breaking them. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. Um. So, I guess, is there any chapters in this book you are you are you're prouder of than others? I think triple any chapter punch, you go. Yeah, Sorry. I mean, triple punches. I've never really, uh, maybe once, had some discuss triple punch. When when a couple of things happen at the same time in a punchline, you're overloaded. So one of the, one of the early jokes I ever wrote was if, if you're sick of being covered in cat hair. Um, get some sellotape and wrap it around your cat, right? Now, that, that's a double <laughs> punch because you're misdirected because you think I'm going to see a wrap around your hand. So I've you, tricked you. Yeah. But as you get the first punch of misdirection, that's one punch, you get a visual image of a cat wrapped in sellotape. So that's a double punch. I'm making you think something while I'm making you feel tricked. That's a yeah. double punch. I, 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 You thought you knew where I was going. You didn't. And I made you have a mental image. That's double. So I break down a rich hall joke there's a triple punch. There's emotion, a cerebral connection, and a visual image. What I did was I broke down why it was brilliant, then I rewrote the joke badly so that there was no triple punch. One bit of information was early on, and later there were two. Uh, um, there was no emotion, just a cerebral connection. The visual image happened at the beginning of the joke, showing you that you're not overloading the person. Because if you give someone a, a nice mental image but it's not funny, then later on you give them uh, a cerebral connection then they go, oh, that's a nice joke. But I'm sh- I'm shoving it all in one go. Yeah. I'm going to punch someone three times. If you had three fists in a boxing match and you hit them with three <laughs> punches at the sound, and obviously physically you need, you need to put your body where it's a bad analogy. You got my point though, right? Yeah. Um, if you could punch th- someone three times in the, I mean, Muhammad Ali was known for speed, wasn't that? It was his thing. If you punch yeah. someone three times in the, in the head, for every time they can reach you and punch you once, you know, they're going to go down. It's if it's the same impact on each punch as theirs, you go bam, 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 like that. And, you know, comedy, when done well, just absolutely stimulates and overloads your brain with lovely things. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, for anybody that's thinking about getting into it, that maybe has started reading the book, when it when it goes well, there's, I, it's, I had a chat once with a um, a, a comedian on the circuit, and I said to them, "Can it ever get better than the first time, the first gig you ever did?" Because it, it constant. The first one was okay; it was a friendly atmosphere, etc. But I came off that stage, and I couldn't sleep for two days. My head was just in a whirlwind. Like, oh, you've done this. This was great. 
And it's like, well, I only ever intended to do one gig. Oh, it. really? Well, and then it was no, like, oh, no, 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 no. I want that feeling again. How do I get that feeling again? So it, I remember, because your first gig, all the material was new as well. So I, I remember doing like my 10th gig and it was, wasn't many, many people in. And the first gig, there were like 160 people. So it was packed room and it was buzzing. And, mm. and I remember my 10th gig going, well, I've said all this before now nine times. And it's a bit of a shit atmosphere. It's just like not not much fun, not much fun. But, you know, you really got to have a great gig to get that buzz the same as the first one. I mean, it ha- has happened. Of course it's happened. But why well, I say, of course, it has happened. But I wouldn't say uh, it takes a very special gig to go as, to feel as good as your first gig if your first gig went well. But saying yep. that, you know, I did a gig the other day and I buzzed for an hour afterwards. And that's 30 years in. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I'm still on, I'm still on the uh, when it goes well. It's it's a good it's a good two to three hours in my head. Um, can't sleep. Can't think about anything else. That's and great. I'm so pleased. I'm so pleased for you. It's uh, I'm I'm still at that that happy stage. It hasn't hasn't brought me down yet. <laughs> well, this is the thing. Like you know, when I have a good gig, I had a gig that there was a bit average, and I I forgot about the gig within two minutes of coming off stage. But I did a gig uh, the night before. And wasn't the easiest room, but whatever reason, somehow the audience were very up for it. They, it's not their fault it wasn't an easy room. They, they didn't choose the noise from the next door, next room. Yeah. Um, and and I buzzed, yeah, I buzzed for now on the way home, maybe 45 minutes driving home. It's great. You know, you drive to a gig in traffic and you drive home for the gig buzzing with no traffic. So the journey home yeah. is inevitably nice in the journey there. Yes. Very, very true, actually. So it's it's actually nice to hear that even after all those years, you still you still get that uh, that buzz of when it goes well, and you can just I don't know feed off it and it ignites something again. Not that it's ever gone out, but do you know what I mean? It has that it that night had such an impact that it's still in your head. Yeah, well, also having some new material that you're honing in. Is lovely yep. too. You know, that's like opening a wardrobe and having a new coat to put on. Go, oh, there's my new coat. I love my new coat. Let's see how <laughs> it's working in my new coat. So, yeah, there's that, there's that feeling and a bit of improv. But, yeah, something, you know, I find that the, the less new material I've got, the more I improvise because the improv is making up for the lack of new stuff to, for me to get excited by. But the other yeah. day I, on stage, I had quite a lot of new stuff and I just banged it all out and I, did so little improv, it was fine because the audience liked it and I liked it. That's the bit, you know, you've got to both enjoy it. But I did so little improv because I had so much new stuff to work with. So, yeah, yeah, my thing is I improvise more when I haven't got much to do that's exciting. <laughs> I, I guess it's all on the night as well, isn't it? You, you you feed off what's gone on before you and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, it, it's true. But my point is if I've got loads of new stuff, I might just get my head down and get on with it because I'm so yeah. excited to, to share it. Cool. So um, I think one thing that a lot of certainly on the open mic circuit can potentially learn a lot of um, is about how to trimming down the jokes that I've kind of already mentioned is that kind of making them that little bit snappier, a little bit punchier, but also how, how to think about adding toppers well yeah so the the, the, the method i i mean my standard method for toppers is i'm improvising on stage so i say something i'm in the moment this is what's so important to be present because i say the words thinking about what i'm saying and then a top up occurs to me if you're reciting it thinking about what you're gonna have for dinner that night you're not going to be thinking about other stuff so be present when you're doing your material and you're more likely to think of something and just say it so i've got routines that have grown and grown and grown on stage you know they've got five toppers literally originally there was one each time yes. i say it, i remember i came off stage at the comedy store once i said to joe caulfield what did i just say about that thing with the front row and she told me <laughs> that i couldn't remember but the the um but the radio four experience was i was writing at three in the morning i was writing subscribing my existing stand-up that happened to be in one episode of, of a radio four show and as i'm typing it something occurred to me as i was typing and i went oh yeah wow now, my point is here that if you're typing something you've said a hundred times, as you're typing it, it's very possible you're daydream. And by daydreaming, you're 
possibly daydream about what you're doing. Yeah. And then the, your brain comes up with a thought that you didn't intend to have. So it's not like I'm going, I need to write a joke about sugar cubes as I'm writing this thing about sugar. What happens is I'm typing out sugar cubes. I drift and I have a thought about sugar cubes. So, yeah. you know, every joke's an ad lib the first time you thought of it. Yeah. I guess that's, that's one of the key things is that I guess most people nowadays should be whenever something drops into that into your head, even if it's not on stage, it's just around. Just get get it written down in some way or noted down, and use it as a reference to come back to at some point because you never know when it's going to come in useful. Yeah, well, I, I mean, God, I've 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 got lines that took five years to even see the light of day because they were just a idea that didn't seem very funny and then one day I just went oh how about like that <laughs> I've had lines that took five years to even try because I didn't think they were funny and I'm on stage talking about someone's job and I go well I've yeah. got a joke about that that I haven't tried yet I do it and the, the room goes boom and I go oh turns out it was funny so I think I suppose <laughs> the, the moral of the story is try everything isn't it yeah yeah definitely and just yeah, make make the most of um, any moments you have on stage because you just don't know what's going to come out. And I think as well is that some people need to... I, I had this at the start, was I had a fear of um, things going badly so I'd stick to the same kind of stuff. And you would never allow yourself to do anything new. Um, I've, been, I've been guilty of that. You're, you're headlining a gig or closing a gig. The middle act stormed it. The crowd yeah. getting a bit tired. Interval's gone on too long, and I go, "I'm not going to do that new bit. I want to. I want to. I, I have a responsibility to to keep the bar up high, because if it drops, the audience will go away. Going, oh, it was good in the middle, but it wasn't good at the end. So, you know, sometimes the bar goes up to the point that I don't do any new material. Yeah, I think I think on <clears throat> on this on the lower part of the scene, I think it's always important as well, though, to give those new bits a go. And if you can go in, I've started going into places now with the attitude of, if it doesn't work, I'm probably not going to see half these people again. <laughs> you still owe them so, a good evening. Though. You still owe them a good yeah, evening. Yeah, you, you still want to have the fun and, and try and be entertaining. But if that if that is one or two extra new jokes that you put in didn't quite work, it doesn't matter. There's still the others that they're going to laugh at. I, I agree. It's a, it's, it's a balance. But, I mean, some new comedians are trying new stuff every gig and they're not honing in what they're doing. And that's yep. a mistake. And some co- new comedians are doing verbatim the same gig year in, year out, because they just go, no, it works. I've got a set of works. And I've been guilty of that, I mean, not, not word for word every night, but I've been guilty of not turning over my stuff. And I mentioned it in the book, you know, but, you know, I, I've been guilty of resting on my laurels. Um, before you know it, new bit's old. You know, you got, I'm doing that yeah. new bit tonight about my wedding. You're, you're going for divorce. <laughs> it's, it's <not> true. <laughs> um, the, the, um, but, but the thing is that, like, yeah, I think chugging one or two in every night's great. I've watched someone, you know, struggling with new material, closing a show when the act before them stormed it, and I'm like, "What are you doing? What are you doing? That you're yeah. you're, you're dropping the ball in a room that's really up high." Yeah. By by doing this new, but it's like, don't you care about the evening? Yes, it's a fair point. I'm talking so about. Do you find? Um... I'm talking about when the bar is really high. And yeah. you're following someone who's done really well, and you're experimenting with something that you might, you know, might not work, and then lo and behold, it doesn't. I think that's a dangerous thing to do. Oh yeah, definitely. So you, a, um, I guess, I guess you are because you, you're doing the ghostwriting, but workshopping ideas and stuff like that. Because I actually had, I've had a, I've had a moment recently. Um, it actually happened last night. Is I've this new part starts my set. I have. Have I do I go do the rule of three things with with a certain topic and I get to the third one and the third one I always think is actually quite good but for the first three or four times I tried it nothing oh you had you had conviction in the joke yeah and and that 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 third one is crucial to then the next section that I talk about without right. that third one the next section can't exist but the next section is the bit that actually. It gets the, it gets the best laugh. So the the idea is that the premise of it is is talking about um, being Jewish but not Jewish. 
That's so I, I give a couple. You know, I, I I'm Jewish, but I eat bacon. Um, I always thought the kipper was a hat, and then I move on to um, the most common thing, I guess, would be about circumcision. And the way I've said it has always kind of made the room kind of go ooh. But then it moves on to another part, which talks about um, the qualifications you need to carry out that operation. In other words, you don't need to be a medical doctor. And then it, go, it, it then evolves then into stuff like, um, what's the job application like? And is there any exclusion criteria? And right. this is, well, one of the exclusion criteria is you can't have Parkinson's. And that, that always gets a really good laugh. Right. But the circumcision bit before that was always flat. And it's just like, I, I want to keep the Parkinson's bit in, but I want to lose the circumcision bit, but I can't because then the next bit makes no sense. <laughs> maybe, you actually, should, maybe you should trim down your circumcision joke. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is, the, this is the thing, is that well, I was talking to uh, friend, an actual mutual friend of ours, and I mentioned this to her last night before at Backyard and said, this bit's not working for me. I don't know what it is. I don't know how I can get around it. I need some eyes on it. And I said it to her and she said, they're trying to joke about child mutilation. I'm like, yeah, how do I do that? And they said, she said, don't. Uh... She, said, she said, turn it into something sillier. So she, she came up with the suggestion, which was don't talk about it happening. Talk about, well, I'm glad it happened when I was young rather than when I'm old because I can't afford to lose anymore. That's nice. And that was just like, ah. That was a hoe. I've mentioned it. Yeah. I've mentioned it without mentioning it. Yeah. I that's mentioned nice. circumcision. And that worked. And I, I, I just went on stage and thought, fuck it, I'm going to try this line. And tried it. And it was like, it was better. It was a lot better. Uh, lovely. The honing process. The honing process. And this is, the, this is the thing, if you're, if you're turning over your material too fast, it never gets to be as good as it can be. You need to, you need to find a balance because it's, it's great being prolific. But most of the time you're gigging to people who haven't seen you before, doing new stuff yeah. that's half-baked, having dropped newish stuff that was half-baked. You know, get it, get it tight. You know, that, that tweak and tweak and tweak. And then you might maybe find a topper to the new bit. And then before you know it, the, the routine's flying. You know, it's just nuts, tightening nuts, isn't it? Yeah. But it's, it's, it's just interesting having somebody else's opinion on things when... Absolutely. All sitcoms are written by teams. Only Fools and Horses is the only sitcom I can think of that's not written by a team. Mm. Yeah. Probably true. Collaborate. Yeah. So that kind of brings on to, uh, a, I say, a smooth segue. Not quite smooth, but um, you seem to be doing a little bit of a touring masterclass at the moment. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very exciting. Um, so Sal Melola in Bath, good friend of mine, said, how about we do a masterclass and we get 10 people around a table, we cap it at 10 so they can get the most out of you and we just sit around a table asking questions and he put it out there on Facebook and he sold it out very quickly and we went to um, his own venue in in, in annex to his home and we sat around, we broke for lunch, he actually cooked everyone lunch Um, and it was really successful and we did another one and one of the people came back for more, which was great. (laughs) <laughs> and then we're now about to do our third, and they've all they've all sold out. So I've done two in Holland, I've done two in Bath, got a third one coming out. I've done one in London, and the day after the one in London, someone on the class said, "I'd like to come back and do another one." Are we doing another one? So I thought about it and put another one out there for April. The only reason it's April is because I'm doing so many on Sundays between now and then. I've got some pencil, not confirmed, but I didn't have a Sunday until yeah. April. Um, and then we put that, and that sold out by less one ticket. There's one free ticket that, um, um, in less than twenty, less than forty eight hours. So it's very exciting. So it's you know social media, bang, this is happening. The one in Holland, they sold out two on WhatsApp group. They didn't even advertise it. Just WhatsApp. Group. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. It, what, what, I mean, what's incredible is turning up to a room in in Utrecht, and there's they, we 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 cap it at twelve in Holland because of flights and accommodation. And they said, well, can we push it to 14 because we need, you know, more people to come, which was a little bit few too many. I think 12 is the absolute limit. Um, mm-hmm. But but um, I turned up in a room, there were 14 people sitting at a table holding my book. In a, in, in a, <laughs> in, and I'd never met any of them before. You know, in, obviously in England, p- people know my name just through, you know, being around a lot or, you know, bits of telly in the 90s. But... I haven't done anything on in Holland and, and they, they all turn up with my book and it was, um, 
yeah, really made the world seem very small. Yeah, you know, I get I get stories on Instagram from you know Singapore, Saudi Arabia. You just say Saudi now, don't you? But the the um, with people holding up my book, and you go, you can hate Amazon and all it stands for. Yeah, but from my perspective, I'm not going to sell a book in Saudi without it. Mm. So the, the book is actually self. Is it self published within yeah. Amazon? Yeah, I I, I lo- uploaded a PDF of the book, a PDF of the cover, and they did Amazon did the rest. Oh, okay. So it's it's that easy to get get yourself published. So then obviously it really the, is, the marketing it, after is the top. It bit. really the marketing's the hard bit. But I had a head start because I had an industry supporting me. Whereas if you wrote a you know a novel about space hoppers. <laughs> you, you're less likely to get on the comedian, comedian podcast, or, or I wouldn't be here right now. You know, you wouldn't hear Adam Bloom's written a novel. You probably wouldn't even heard I'd written a novel. You know, yeah. that it's a whole different world. So I had the backing of an industry and the backing of Amazon, as in they were happy to, you know, anyone can open an account. I, I think self publishing is, is the equivalent of being a YouTuber because you don't yeah. have a TV company giving you the green light, you just do it yourself. So we're living in this world now where everyone just goes out with their phone and puts something out there. Yeah. So in, in the masterclasses themselves, so what, what's the, how, what happens in them? Very, very Without simple. Too much away. Very, no, no, no. Give, I'll give it all away. We are all say our names clockwise, how long we've been doing stand-up, like an AA meeting. And then, <laughs> and then we go clockwise around the room and people go, right, ball and cube. Can you explain what a ball and cube is? And I go into detail about the ball and cube. Some people have got a joke they w- want to brainstorm. Some said to me, they, when I come to the London Mars class, um, will we be going through jokes? I said, you can go through anything you want. Yeah. If you, you, you want to use your time. I mean, no one's, you know, no one's capped to, uh, you know, we, we, went out, we went, ran over by 45 minutes the other day because no one was in a rush. So I said to my host, do we need the room? Can we have the room for another half hour? They suggest, hmm. I said, hands up anyone who needs to go early as in on time, nobody. So we stayed longer. Um, the, the, you go around the room and people just ask questions. But the good thing is other people chip in. So when someone asks a question, I answer it. Someone else will say, can you elaborate on that, please? So everyone gets to hear six hours of an- answers and questions. Okay. They don't only speak to me one-on-one. They, we all chat together as a group. And you get, more, you, know, you get more confident characters and you people chipping in more than others. Um, but by the end of the day, everyone's had every answer, question answered, and they have a greater understanding of the book and hopefully, therefore, of comedy. But, you know, persona comes up a lot. Um, the ball and cube, which is about rolling energy, you'll probably remember it. About, I, I think yep. all jokes are either balls or cubes. And cubes need a push on an ice rink. Yep. And a ball, if you tap it, it will roll and roll and roll. So if a ball hits a cube, the cube is more likely to get a push than if you tap it on your own. So jokes that obviously this is, I can't describe it all now, but basically when I explain a whole chapter on a theory, of course it's not going to be 100% clear for everyone all the way through. And I, with my mum, I checked the bits, of, does this make sense? My mum didn't read the whole book. My mum mm. read the bits that I thought might be complicated, but I still can't predict what any individual is going to have, have a problem with. Um, yeah. I mean, thank God the book isn't clear. Otherwise, I wouldn't be doing any master classes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, th- I think it's one of those things in it these days where there's this how how certain people want to get so much more information out of things. And I guess in the old days, as such, in say old days, twenty years ago, these things master classes probably didn't happen. And the book leads brings everything together. And now everybody has the ability to pretty much travel, even if it's like now on a on a call to go through stuff. There's there's stuff that everybody can learn, and it's just about if you want to learn it, it's there. Go and find it. And I, I love the idea of twelve people in a room just reading a book, and then like they've they've come together because of that book, and they've come together to learn and understand and want to get something else out of it. It's almost yeah, like it's coaching wonderful. in a way. It, like what? Like coaching? Yeah. Yeah. It, so it's I, I don't know. Go on. Oh, sorry. It's just that the other day in London, uh, it's a particularly nice venue as well. And one by one, people turned out. I think I, I arrived second 
Um, and then one by one, people started turning up and it just walked in. People walked in fresh faced. They walked in, they got their bag, they got their coat and they put their bag down, they take the coat off and we shake hands and everyone has a coffee. And I just went, I can tell this is going to be a good one. You know, they've all, they've all been yeah. good. They've all been good. Um, there, there's something about, you know, I'm a Londoner, born and bred and there's something quite nice about doing my first one in my city. Um, mm. You know, there, there's something about that, not just not traveling. I mean, look, one I did in Leicester was great, and that was the afternoon of a gig I had in Leicester. We got one in yeah. Birmingham, Pennsylvania, and I, it's at the same venue, the Glee Club, that I'll be performing the night before and that night. So I'll do my gig yeah. at Glee, stay in a hotel, wake up, have breakfast, walk to the Glee again, do the master class, then go straight to my gig from the master class in the same building. <laughs> Saves traveling time. Well, yeah, the, the, you know, the, they were both deliberately planned around that. So the only one I'm, and even at Utrecht, Utrecht got me a gig, so I was I was yeah. going over there to do a gig as well. Bath is the only one so far I've just driven specifically to, but it's well worth it. You know, there's no, there's no, you know, we got one in Belfast, Pencil. I'd be flying over. Yeah, no, it's 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 good to see, and it's it's not it's because I guess it's part of the, um, especially for a newbie like trying to get into comedy a lot of people go down the course route just to get that experience or whatever else is that little push to get them on that stage and that's all about wanting to learn and do this and do that and then this is this master class like with the book and everything it feels like it's the next level one you've done, I, I you've done that, your yeah, first few the, i mean the courses the good thing about the courses are they help you do your first gig by your first performance is in front of the other people on the course and their friends and family, yeah. which is great because it's like having stabilizers on a bicycle. You know, from then on, yes. which is, I mean, when you take the stabilizers off a bike, there's a good chance you're going to fall on the floor, and when that happens, yep. it's going to hurt. However, getting your first gig out of the way is a very important thing to do because it's the hardest part. Stepping on the stage, the first, it's the most rewarding part, as we talked about, but it's the hardest part. You know, being backstage yeah. and going, oh my god, 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 the fear inside me, my first gig. But, oh. <laughs> yeah, you've got to get out of the way. You've got to get out of the way. Has to be done. Yeah, I, I, I had a, I got a, one of those smartwatches for the first gig, and you can see the heart rate. <laughs> <laughs> just, just like that, that went high, <laughs> right. and that was just like you could kind of say, right. This was my heart rate at eight o'clock, and I I got on the stage at twenty past eight or whatever, and you just see the heart rate start going up. Oh, up, really? Up, up, in anticipation, and then when you're on the stage, it's I don't know the full adrenaline, and then the come down after it. I sat there last night after a gig at Backyard, and sat next to a mate of mine, and I just looked at my watch and went, "I'm off the stage. I've been off the stage for three minutes, and my heart rate's 130 beats a minute." What is it normally? My resting heart rate is about 55. No. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> you know, the, you know, they've got those gong competitions where <clears throat> the comedian has to beat the gong or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Various formats like that. What if they had your heart rate on the, on the stage, on the screen behind you, and you had to leave the stage if your heart rate reached a certain part? <laughs> no, 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 too nervous. Gong. <laughs> No, I've got a. Um, I used to have a love hate relationship with gong shows, and I have a hate hate relationship with gong shows. Oh, fair enough. <clears throat> um, it's not. I mean, it's not fair. It's not fair. But that's part of the gladiatorial. You know, I went to watch the yeah. King Gong at the Comedy Store, and I it was so exciting. You know, there's three people out of four hundred who have a red card, and when they hold their red card up, you're off. No, no debate. Yeah. And there was one bit when the audience were turning on the person with the third card. Because yes. they want to raise their card, and the crowd were like, "Don't you dare!" That person's got so much power, right? Yeah, and they literally are choosing whether the audience get to hear the rest of their set or not. And it yep. got really, it got really tense. Then one person was, um, his name's Ray Presto, um, does magic. I, I believe he died um, recently, but quite an old guy. And he was getting, um, getting booed off. And then he had fans in the audience who'd been seen him before, and they started going, Ray, 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 Ray. So you've got the people <laughs> booing and the people chanting this battle, like a run the MC yeah. Aerosmith video, just <laughs> back and forth, back and forth. <laughs> and then what he did, the greatest thing, he did an Elvis Presley like that with his finger across the room. He went, he knelt down, he went, and stop the control, like slicing it. 
And when he went like yeah. that, slice, the room stopped booing. He controlled it. But the beautiful thing was, he was acting like Elvis on stage. 75% of the room wanted him off, but the 25% <laughs> saved him. They, yeah. they saved him. They carried it through. And then when he did that to stop, he was like, yeah, okay, I'm Elvis now. Just you stop. And it was so cool yeah. because he was acting like the coolest man in the world. He'd just nearly been booed off. And it was such a beautiful yeah. contrast with this man going, yeah. And then he carried on his set. Um, but the, the, the Elvis, one of my favorite moments on stage I've ever seen, the, the Elvis moment was just like, it, I, it was acted like he was in his element as a performer when literally 10 seconds ago yeah. he was nearly getting booed off stage. I hope I've communicated that thought, but it was just beautiful how, how shameless he were, was about being cool. He, well, you know, I, I'd have gone, hey, thank you so much for helping me in my hour of need. But he just went straight for the yeah. showbiz and cut, the, cut it. Zoom. Oh, yeah. beautiful. Uh, gong, gongs are an interesting thing. Uh, I think it's, uh, I've come to the conclusion there's two types of comedians, those that love gong shows and those that don't. Those that do are because they've got through and those that don't because they've not. <laughs> well, it's very much Steve Bennett from Chortle, you, you know, can be quite brutal with his reviews. And I'd be sitting at a hotel bar at two in the morning, sitting with comedians talking and someone would say, oh, I don't, you know, I don't like the way he reviews and, da, 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 and they start to give their opinion. And then 20 minutes in, inevitably, their bad review will come up. Yeah. He's like the Mitch Hedberg joke. A, a ducks, I found Duck's opinion on me varies greatly depending on whether or not I have bread on me. Right. And, you know, <laughs> like, it's the same thing, you know your opinion on gongs or whether you've been gonged off before and your opinion on Steve yeah. Bennett reviews and whether he's reviewed you bad. Now, of course, that's not, that's a generalization. There are people who get good reviews don't like it. And there are people who have survived the gong that don't like it. The trouble with the gong format is if your takes a while to set up your persona or get to your first laugh, you're in trouble. You know, storytelling. Yeah. It suits, it suits more alpha male one-linery, two-linery, you know, co controversial topic. Da -da -da, you know, you go on stage, you grab them with a, 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 a edgy joke and you're right yeah. in their face but you know if you're, if you're doing whimsical stories you know you, you do it is a greater risk because the audience they might go nah not into this you know you're chucking gentle ideas in the air so I'm yeah. sure there are people who don't sit the gong yeah definitely but in talking about I guess audiences and stuff like that so how from from your years of experience in watching fairly new comedians come on board and stuff, what's the what's the one common mistake you see somebody do, and you see it from multiple people, and you've got your head in your hands going, no, don't do that, don't do that, just don't. Um, acknowledging a gig's going badly without being funny. Okay. So, so I elaborate. Yes, please. Saying that joke normally works is pure ego. It's pure ego. Yeah. If you're having a bad gig, you need to tell them that you're better than they think you are. Um, I've done it in corporates, but in a club environment, you know, if a joke doesn't work, move on. If the next joke doesn't work, either move on or acknowledge it in a funny way. Matt Welcome was in Holland with Matt Welcome, 2003. Two jokes in a row didn't work, and he went, you can ask for a refund, you won't get it. <laughs> yeah, you, know, said, yeah, you, can ask for, you can ask for your money back, you won't get it. And it was yeah. funny. You know, I saw Matt Lucas as Sir Bernard Jumley 28 years ago. <clears throat> wow. Even 29 years ago. And um, a couple of jokes didn't work. And he went, uh, he, he sort of motioned towards the microphone. He went, I have the power. Effectively, I am she <laughs> Any younger people in, um, um, what's his name? He what's Man Masters of the Universe. He Man Masters of the Universe, yeah. Um, his name's Adam and his sister called She Ra. Yeah, effectively, I am She Ra. And it's just, yeah. you know, beautiful sentence. Effectively, yes. I am She Ra. And bring in, you know, a nostalgia, you know, a, a cartoon from the 80s. He, he didn't care. And by not caring, we warmed to him. But he didn't care by not being funny. He cared by being funny, which ultimately is caring. So it's a kind of yes. paradox. But, you know, I talked to Tom, Tom, Tom Stade the other day, and I said, what's the best disclaimer you've ever seen? 
he said, I can't remember her name, but I was on stage, I was watching a female comedian on stage in Canada, and it was a high stage, and she was dying. And she knelt down and she looked at a guy in the front row, right eye contact, close up. And she says, ha-, he said, sorry, she said, has it occurred to you that you might have just died and this is your hell? <laughs> is that great? So she's put all of it. The problem's his now. The problem's his yeah. now. Now they're laughing at him. Well, obviously they're laughing at the appreciation yeah. of the inventiveness of the idea, but they're also laughing at him. You are going through hell right now. And, um, yeah. you know, I, I, I'd, I'd pay a couple hundred quid for that line. I, I've never bought a line before, but I desperately wish I'd thought of that line. Yeah. Uh, I, th- I think we all, we all get that, don't we? It's like, oh, why couldn't I think it? Yeah, 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 sure. Uh, there's, there's probably millions of us out there that are thinking that and think it every time. You see somebody on stage and you, you just go, that was so obvious. Why didn't... Especially what, if it's yeah. something on the night, you somebody sees something and makes a comment, you go, oh, that was a missed opportunity. Well, I, I like it when a joke, you know, Milton Jones does it all the time. We go, how come no one's thought that? There's a newer comedian called Belle Gold, and I watched her. I actually specifically went to see her at a gig recently, and she went, she was quite gentle and sort of quite meek, I suppose, and she wears a little sort of pretty hat that maybe you'd think someone in maybe in 1980s, 70s would wear the kind of, I don't know, dainty yeah. would be a good word. And she said, um, whenever I go out to check the weather, it's always there. <laughs> and, and I was like, wow. Because weather is ever, isn't it? Weather is the world, isn't it? Weather's, yeah. <laughs> whatever the weather is, it's still there, isn't it? It's always weather, be it yeah. rainy or sunny. Whenever I go out to check the weather, it's always there. And I was like, wow, that means you've got to, I mean, it hit my head. It, all, it like spun me out. When you walk out the front door, how did the weather not be there? It's, it just it blew me away. And I've told a couple of yeah. comedians, and they've cracked up laughing. I actually contacted Milton Jones to tell him about it. I told Ed Byrne, walking down the street after I was his brilliant show the other day at Soho Theatre. But, um, you know, just every now and again, I hear a line such as that, when you go, how come no one's thought of that? You know, Milton Jones had a line. People talk about earthworms as if there are worms from another planet. <laughs> it's great isn't it and you go how come yeah. no one said the word earthworm and not thought about the planet rather than the soil yeah nice no, uh, I don't know you, you see you see the geniuses out there and, and stuff like that and you just I, I, certainly at my level it's like you, you look at, in awe at people and kind of just how some people can I guess it's touching on it a bit, a bit in the book about how you carry yourself on stage and the persona you give off and stuff like that. And when you're you're kind of still quite new, you're still trying to find what that is. I'm trying are to work you, out are you still what going you for that I think so. I think I'm getting a lot more comfortable with who I am. Um, I think I think the, the, my biggest breakthrough at one point was actually I did a I did a brand new set that I just kind of made up the day before. I had the theme, I went and done it, I thought it went really well. It came off, and I spoke to a friend of mine, we went through it like with a fine tooth comb about bits and pieces. And then I went to do it at another gig, and I completely forgot about three quarters of it. it I'm not just surprised went, you did a brand new just bit. just disappeared. I'm not surprised you did a whole um, brand new bit. Yeah, and um, the, the thing that I got out of that was that I started then playing with the audience whilst I was biding time. So the audience knew I'd forgotten. Okay. I completely had charming? it with me. Was but... that charming? Sorry? Was it charming? Oh, it was lovely. It was it was well, I was well, at the well, point well, where I'm I'm just walking around the stage in circles going, Yeah, this bit's gone. I need to work this bit out. And I've got the audience shouting like last lines that I've said. And well, they're did shouting something. At... Yeah, well they there's there's a bit that I talk about being with my uh, my partner for twenty six years. And then somebody from the audience went, 25 years. I went, no, it was 26. Listen properly. <laughs> and it was it was that kind of improvised. That was the first time I've proper done interaction. And everything started to come. And I, re- I remembered everything again. But I brought it back in in such a way that it kind of, the audience really enjoyed it. And the comments I got after was, was that plan? And it was just like, 
Honestly, no, it wasn't. But they said, we don't care. It was so much fun. And I went away going, I fucked up. I got some really good clips out of it. <laughs> and I learned something else. That's great. Interaction. What I don't, and yeah, the audience you, you'll know next time when an audience likes you and something happens and you're vulnerable, you'll know how to turn on the charm to maximize that. But what I don't like is when people recreate that exact moment by pretending they've forgotten. Yes. I, I did I did try it once. Yes. I, uh-huh. I tried one little part, but it led it leads into um about growing old. And one of the things about growing old is you forget things. So that mishap brought this part into the set. So I did a gig and I sat there and I've I've gone to this next section. I've gone, Oh, this bit always gets me. I can't I, I'm I'm like literally clicking my fingers. And there was a girl to my right sat on the floor or sat on a chair. And I heard her go, oh, no, as in, please remember, please remember. Oh. And I went, yeah, that moment when you get old and you keep forgetting things. And everyone kind of went, ah, oh, gotcha. But it was just that little one liner rather than a I whole got, I got a, section. It was I a nice little leading. I got, I got a short term memory joke that I repeat um, on purpose. Um, but, yeah, no, it's great. But that, you know, when an audience likes you, you're allowed to fail, and it can be very endearing. And um, yeah, but it's that. But you'll you'll know next time. You probably already do know how to turn on the charm to make them to allow them to like you even more during those moments. You know, I've had a guy. Yeah. I was in a gig in High Wycombe, nice big theatre, high stage, proper pucker theatre, and somebody put his hand up and went, "Do you know?" Uh, and I won't say the name, but a French woman called Da Da Da, and I went, yeah. Mm-hmm. He went, Did, who you went on a date with years ago? And I went, yeah. And he went, that's my mum. <laughs> and um, and the audience just fell about, and they looked at me like they could see that I didn't know what to say next, and they loved the fact that I was thrown. You know, there's nothing wrong yeah. with a comedian being thrown. It can be very beautiful. I think if you're thrown when you're doing a gig and it's you know, you're getting heckled when you're not doing well when you get thrown, then you drop the ball. But a yeah. guy, you know, a twenty year old kid was p- pointing out that y- you've gone on a date with his mum. So is it you know, he's gone to go into a comedy club, she's gone, Who's on? It said the line up, he's gone, Oh my god, I went on a date with him years ago. So yeah, and I just I kind of melted in vulnerability and they loved it. So what yeah. happened? The audience had a nice time. But here's the thing, yeah. when that moment happens, I know exactly what's happening. I'm not faking vulnerability, but I'm I'm allowing them to see the vulnerability because I'm I'm turning up the thing that's that's making it magical. It's not contrived yeah. and fake. I'm just aware that this moment is magical. Rather than go, oh, yeah, um and try and put the guy down or come back with something witty. You know, I've told a friend the story yeah. and they like, you should have said this. And I was like, No, I shouldn't have done, because that would have made me in too much in control. You know. When someone smashes yeah. a tennis ball at you, you smash it back. But no one smashed a ball at me. It, it wasn't a smash. It was a, it was, it was a yeah. completely different thing. It wasn't even a shot. And, um, yeah, so kind of, here we go. Smashing back a ball that doesn't exist is a mistake. Yes. Because that guy was yeah. – he knew what he was doing. He was like, this will this this be interesting. You know, and, and and it was interesting, but my point is, if I came back with a witty instant line, I'd have killed the moment, which was me being vulnerable. Yep. So I learnt through time to let those moments breathe, and those be- you would stifle yeah. that moment by saying something really witty. No, it's, that's that's quite insightful. It's there's always that uh, feeling that you've got to come back with something. <laughs> It, I mean, look, like you say, if, you're, the... if someone does an aggressive heckle at your expense, then yes, you do have to. But when somebody, mm. you know, when, when something, the gig's going well and someone says something that's really unusual, you can celebrate that moment. I, I probably wait till it all died down and then says something witty. But I did yeah. not stifle that moment by being, check me out, I can, I can get out of anything because being in it was part of the, the, be- the beauty. Yeah. Uh, this. That's, that's lovely to hear, actually. It's it's nice, like from hope from my point of view, and hopefully from a lot of the listeners' point of view that are actually on the open mic circuit about these kind of valuable things to learn from professionals, so you don't make mistakes that could cost you things in the future, and how to handle yourself. 
Yeah, I mean, everyone's always got their own way of dealing with it. I'm sure Jimmy Carr's version would be different um, because he doesn't yeah. show vulnerability. That's not his style. Um, but yeah, everyone's got to... This is the thing about understanding your own persona, you know, knowing what, what, how you should react in a situation because how Woody Allen reacts to a certain heckle is not the same way that, that, um, that Frankie Boyle would. No. And that's very no, important to understand yeah. your persona. I mean, Paul Foot. I was talking about Paul Foot the other day. I saw Paul Foot getting heckled, and he went, "Please don't heckle. I can't cope." And it's it, it just you know how in character is that. And another time I saw him heckled, he went, yeah. "Don't heckle, or I shall take out my sword and slay you." My sword. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> I shall take out my sword and slay you. I'm sure I had sword and saw both do similar things. They slice through things. It's just a D at the end. Yeah. Oh my God, sword is the past tense of to saw. So a sword is actually the past tense of an object that does a similar thing. I sawed yeah. it in half with my sword. <laughs> see, this this is where I can see a um, a comedian's brain on exposed in this kind of scenario. I don't have that yet, but the quick wittedness of of the professionals and how they do things and how how things evolve from a misspoken word. Like well, I, I, I wouldn't touch it's that. It's quite fascinating. I, would, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't touch that in my... Um... Oh, hold on. It says having issues. One second. I'll do that again. Um, but I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't touch that as a gag because I don't do wordplay. But, you know, if Tim Vine was here now, Tim would no. have struck that into a great joke in seconds. So would Milton. Um, but, yeah, yeah, wordplay. I steer clear of wordplay. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, you, certain personas suit that better than others. But... Also, no, sword, um, S-O-A-R-D, think... sword. Sword also means to, to fly over something. So sword can be a singular object, a past tense of what a verb, Yeah, and it can also be a, a to soar over something. <laughs> so my sword soared over <laughs> and soared me in half. You, you can... You can picture Tim Vine and Milton Jones just saying things like that now. I saw Tim say something really funny once in conversation, and he went, "That's going in." It's, uh, that's it's great. Um, so I I think we'll we'll start to wrap up. But I've got to say that I said it before uh, throughout this interview and at the start. The book is a joy to read. I implore anybody that hasn't got it go and get it, and it's only available on Amazon. Is that correct? Yes, what's it called, Mark? It's called Finding Your Comic Genius. I just thought it'd be nice to recap, but I it's, thought it'd be uh, a little, little bit weird if I said it. <laughs> and that's even weirder that I've asked you what it's called. Um, look, I, 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 I knew I'd written an unusual book because it was an advanced book on stand-up. And from what I gather, they're all how to do it books. Um, I had no idea it would be as well-received as it, as it is. I just, I just knew every now and again I'd said something that was well put. I'd articulated... An, yeah. an intricate thought and managed to get it down on paper the way a, a good lawyer would in court. These are the facts. This is the problem. This is the solution. <laughs> that, that's why that person's guilty. So I, 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 I knew I'd written something good. I had no idea that I'd be doing master classes. You know, did I mention Finland as well? Did, yeah. did I mention Finland? No, you mentioned um, Holland, Holland. Utrecht oh, yeah. in Holland. I've got, so I've got doing Finland as well. I've got three penciled in Finland. It probably end up being two. But the point is, I I didn't even the book was out for a good month before the word masterclass was even mentioned to me. I would wouldn't have thought of it. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's very exciting, and it's and it's probably I'm probably ten times as busy as a, as a ghostwriter now as well. So I don't know how I'm finding time for yeah. all these things. But but the point is, <laughs> I genuinely didn't realise the book would lead to this much. I really honestly didn't. It's very, very rewarding. And also the bigger picture is not just money in my bank account. It's it's contributing to the evolution of a lot of people's comedy. And even some veterans have, have said to me, yep. you know, I've, I've, I've gone with, out and done new material night based on this and that and that. People with 45 years experience. Well, that's, that's yes. amazing. So from never been on stage before to 40 plus years, people benefiting that's a, quite a range of people and poets have even got in touch with me uh sorry a poet has even got in touch with me okay. um but yeah so it's 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 it's, it's very exciting and i'm very glad if anyone's listening who's got it I, I hope it's working for you oh i 
everyone I've spoken to that's actually started reading it has has raved about it. So you've done a great job there, Adam. Thank you oh, very thank much you. from me and a lot of open mic comics, I think. That thank are you so much, Mark. Taking the words and moving on from it. So I'll just say um, I'll put a link to the book in the description of this podcast so anybody can get a quick link to it if they don't have it already. Um, so just want to say thank you very much, Adam. Thank you for having me. And until next time, I'll speak to you all soon. 